Christmas time all through the year. Oh, Willamette, please don't let me forget all the good times we've had right here. Oh, Christmas tree. And hello, I am just trying to mute uh, our Facebook feed so that I do not hear, there we go, hear myself uh, 30 seconds later. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Simpson, and I'm with Jeffrey Campbell. Uh, oh. Jeffrey Campbell is, what's the title, lead writer, senior writer? I'm lead writer. Lead writer on uh, Dead Rising 4. Uh, so we're going to talk uh, talk through case two today. Um, this is early on in the game. Um, since the game's only been out uh, about a week now, uh, we're not going to talk about uh, the later stages. And uh, please, if you're uh, in the chat, uh, either on Facebook or on uh, Twitch, you know, a lot of people haven't played through the game. We'd ask you to respect the, them and uh, not spoil the ending, uh, not spoil the later stages. So anything uh, up to and including Case 2, fair game. Anything after that, we would really ask you to respect your fellow fans and not uh, not talk about that um so uh we're gonna gonna play a bit now you uh this is your first game for capcom yes yeah uh yeah. what can you talk uh just briefly mention uh, other games you worked on previously so i was on uh so i was recently on deus ex i was on mankind yeah. divided um i was not a lead writer on that though i wish i was just uh just a flunky writer um Although I think I was their second longest of the writing team, um, and that was a fantastic game. Obviously, huge narrative potential and and lots of uh, weird, crazy designs and 
Um, I think, I mean, I did, uh, I did all kinds of everything on that game, but the, th the, the couple of things that I did that, that I enjoyed the most were, um, I did all the research for all the augmentations, all the science stuff, um, uh, got to liaise with a, with a, um, an implant engineer to decide to, to see if the, the way we were trying to explain all the ridiculous crap actually had any basis in science. Um, I also did a lot of designing and uh, writing for all the AI, yeah. uh, the AI design. So every time you hear a character yell something out in that game, it was something it was something that I had worked on and thought about and tried to figure like how they would express themselves. Yeah. That was a great game. And of course, I wrote lots of cinemas and dialogue and all kinds of other stuff that you know a, a writer normally does. But it was the weird stuff that actually got me most excited about Deus Ex. Um, and then I worked on Prototype Two, uh, and I were, and then my my the closest to my heart was the Pirates of the Caribbean Armada of the Damned, which unfortunately got canceled. Uh, that I was lead writer on. We'd written the whole game; it was all done. You could play the whole thing from beginning to end, and all the dialogue was recorded. Uh, and it was it was such a dream project to work on, like a a pirate RPG. Yeah. And that was a really great game. But that was my first game, and absolutely my favorite experience. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and it didn't happen, so that sucked. But that's 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 how it goes. I knew an art director once who'd worked for 15 years and never had a single game made. Um, so yeah, it, 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 that that happens. That's uh, that's the game industry sometimes. Yep. Um, oh, and I worked on Darkest Dungeon, which okay. is probably my proudest moment. <laughs> All right. Um, we are here. We're at Capcom Vancouver, and uh, we're gonna play through uh, some or most of Case Two, depending on how long this is gonna take me. Um, and uh, we're yeah. here in the corner of the screen here. So, I, I, I suggested case two. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I hope I'm not ruining it. Everybody's only like just picked up the game and they haven't even started. But um, I suggested case two because it's got some challenging narrative stuff in it that that we um, that we wrestled with a lot. Uh, and and right. one of them. And I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear any questions you have. And I'll I'll talk about anything you want. With, you know that Jeff will allow me to talk about. But um. Case 2's got some really interesting stuff. Uh, one of the mandates that I got really early on for the story is that they wanted it to be feel like a like a journalism mystery. That he was on like a, uh, you know, like it's sort of that, uh, what's the term? I saw it on TV Tropes the other day. It's like the intrepid reporter. Um, to, to, really give, uh, to really give Frank that, that feeling like he was looking into a mystery. And so Case 2 is really the, the moment where that sense of mystery is is pretty much the strongest in my mind. It turns it, it's got a lot more like adventure journalism feel throughout, but in case two, he really specifically is investigating a mystery, using his camera the most, um, a lot of talking to people and investigating exactly what's happened in the city. So he comes into case two here, uh, knowing that Obscurus, who's the wacky military uh, private military corporation has taken over the town and they're up to no good doing something and they they're doing investigations of their own frank doesn't really understand exactly how the outbreak started but he knows that obscurus is wrapped up in it he also knows to a certain degree that they probably didn't cause it that they were trying to they're also trying to figure out exactly what happened he also knows that they've been in this town for months uh, because he saw them at the uh, the secret lab in case zero which is the the mission that comes before you get to the mall this is actually the fourth There's case like in the story, assuming you consider the, the prologue to be part of, be like a case, which is really just a, a nightmare that he has. Uh, yeah, so he, he comes into this case knowing that there's someone in town named Paula who knows something about what Obscurus is up to, and so he's going he's gonna to go and try to talk to her. You get a strong impression that he's just going to go and try to like fully take advantage of her and her knowledge of what, of what she knows about, uh, about Obscurus. Wow. Because one of the running themes, especially in the beginning, is that Frank is really here utterly for his own motivation. He is not here to help anyone. In fact, he's pretty much ready to screw anyone just to try to uh, get the story that he came to get and also to do it before uh, his rival his rival student, Vic, gets it. He wants to try to beat her, most most importantly. Now, we just saw another character, Jessa, who's absolutely one of our favorite characters, uh, Shannon, who's the other writer. Um, she's really mouthy. She has the most swears in the whole script. Uh, if you listen to her dialogue in uh, the online, because she's one of the characters you can play in online, she's absolutely the mouthiest character in the game by by a long shot. And we had a lot of fun writing that, because we really tried not to swear continuously. It's not like Prototype 2. If anybody's played that game, you'll know that's probably the mouthiest game ever made. Um, yeah, but so Jessica kind of harkens back to that. She's one of our favorite characters. And I was, I was really glad that we got to have her for online, because she's a lot of fun to play. So a lot of attitude. Because we're doing this uh, kind of commentary, I'm kind of skipping past some of the stuff um, 
I'm going to skip past some of the uh, side missions and the encounters that uh, uh, populate the world, which kind of extend the play experience. But uh, we just kind of want to deal with the, the main story here. Um, so I'm speeding through this on my little uh, go kart. So Paula was a really interesting character for us. Um, there are a bunch of characters uh, who evolved massively over time. Uh, Paula, Darcy, uh, who's the other one? Uh, there's a character named Corey who was eventually cut from the game. Paula, Darcy, Darcy, Corey, and I'm forgetting one. Oh, it was Justin who was completely cut from the game. <laughs> Corey is mentioned briefly. Uh, Corey is one of Paula's apostles. Paula is like, a, she, she's like, a, we had an idea of a pirate radio. Uh, pirate radio, a bunch of guys that were doing pirate radio broadcasts, and that eventually evolved more into the idea that they were, they were like uh, citizen journalists with the, with their own podcast. So Paula runs that podcast, the the undead the undead gospel, according to Paula. Uh, and Darcy is one of her journalists, also her boyfriend. Uh, we wanted to give the impression they were really like, uh, uh, they really had no idea what they were doing. They were really way in over their heads. Although you'll find, I think, that, that both Darcy and Paula managed to kind of keep their head above water through most of this. Uh, although Darcy is one of my favorite characters because he's so ridiculous and, can, can, and like just barely uh, barely capable of dealing with the situation. He gets captured two or three times, and you have to rescue him, and you, you end up taking advantage of him pretty badly, and, and Paula as well. Though Paula was really fun because we had written her as this like straightforward, uh, kind of like boring small town... Uh, she, she was, she was like really eager and really into it. Here, we'll listen to her voice. I'm his editor, and this was a major obscurus I posted until 40 minutes ago. Wait a minute. You're Paula? You sound totally different on the radio. Oh, yeah, that's my character. Character? Yeah, I realize no one listens to me unless I'm yelling all the time. And also, it's kind of fun. Uh... So, if you're ready to listen, maybe you should look around and see what Obscurus is doing here. Right. I will. So yeah, Paula was. So we we went in to record uh, this character that we'd written, who was you know uh, an amateur journalist, who was just really eager, really really into it. And what happened was the actress she was like, "Do you mind if I just take my take on this character?" And she did this like way over the top, like hip hop chick thing. Uh, that was it was it was really strong. The performance was really strong. Um, and on the one hand, we really loved it, but on the other hand. We thought that maybe she'd kind of like overdone it in a, in a kind of a, a, a stereotypical African-American uh, tone that we thought was just th that, that would rub people the wrong way. But we really liked the performance. So what we decided to do with her was say in her podcast, she puts on this character, this really like, you know, like strong, modern uh, African-American character, this strong, like, um, I'm not sure what to say exactly. It was kind of over-the-top performance. Um, and so we decided to let her keep that for the podcast. And in this, this conversation that she has right here, you realize she doesn't talk like that on in person. She has a sort of, she's a more like straightforward person. She still has a little bit of that quality in her voice. But um, she's not, she's not the, she's not that kind of over-the-top characterization that you hear when she calls you on the phone and when you hear her on the podcast. And uh, she says that she only puts on that character because she realized no one was going to listen to her. No one was listening to her unless she was putting on that kind of persona. Um, and so we, we kind of, we were pretty happy about that because it kind of made Paula, it gave Paula a lot of depth right off the bat. And that only happened because the actress had a cool idea in the, in the recording booth. And we didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to completely throw it away, even though we were a little concerned that maybe it was a little over the top. Um, but, but in the end, it kind of created a kind of a, a, a unique characterization for that person. And she ended up being one of my favorite characters, absolutely. The actors can really have a really amazing way of changing uh, the writer's attitude about what the character should be. And if we have enough time to react to that, then we can take advantage of it and make something much cooler. The same thing happened with Calder, which we could, which I don't really think I should talk about. Because that, that guy's so much more towards the end of the game uh, when you start seeing him in person. Uh, but anyway, the actor's, the actor's take on Calder changed our opinion about who that character should be a lot. And we were able to... Um, react to that early on and change the way that he performed in the script and in the cinemas. Yeah, we can uh, we can do these again if this goes well, so uh, we can talk about, uh, about Calder. Do we have any questions um, about, yeah, that, about uh, all that? Let's ta stop into Twitch. I almost forgot how to say that. And uh, not much chat going on in Twitch uh, currently. 
Uh, if you guys do have questions uh, in the Twitch chat, uh, again, please respect the fact that uh, you know some people haven't played the game and this is uh, fairly early days. Um, so we're not talking about past uh, case two here. And let us check uh, Facebook. Uh, this here, is, I'll take uh, over. You check Facebook. All right, I will take uh, Facebook. Uh, Why are you in the furniture store? There's no cinemas in here. What's the point? I came in here because I had to <laughs> run this Twitch stream and check for questions. Okay, all right. Um, we were heading towards the uh, the apartment. So he's already done the city hall investigation. Yes. And like as a, a narrative feature goes, uh, and by narrative feature I mean, you know the 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 specific ways in which we can communicate story information. Mm -hmm. um, the investigation was like a dream come true for me. It was. Oh, I guess I'll keep the fire hammer. <laughs> um, you know, to be able to slow the game down and pull out your camera, photograph things, and uh, have uh, Frank sort of try to make uh, realizations or guesses about what what it, what, it, what that information means to him in the story was a lot of fun. It was, they were really in depth, took a lot of time to write, um, and of course, there, it's a slower moment of the game, so we don't really want to like drive the the game's pace to a complete halt. Um, but we still wanted them to have a lot of richness and really feel like a, you know, like it was a, a, a mystery. You know, Bryce all along he was saying to me, you know, make it a journalism mystery. So, oh no, oh, I thought it crashed for a second. No, no, <coughs> uh, it uh, just popped up here. Yeah, so case two was really the chance to make it make it feel like that. So. We didn't stop to talk about it, but when he was in City Hall, uh, you know, him and Paula looking through the the records, they realized that that Obscurus was, was was searching for something. Had something to do with the sewers. Um, it had something had something to do with something that was very dangerous. So Frank comes to the conclusion that maybe they're looking for they're they're looking for something for someone something very dangerous. Uh, in the chat, we've got uh, Charlie Hojo um, asks, "What's your personal recommend or uh, record for zombies killed?" We're playing currently on my personal uh, Xbox, so uh, you can see I've killed, this is since Tuesday, um, 10,000 zombies. I haven't killed as many as I could have, um, but during uh, E3 and stuff, um, the, the five minute demo, my in five minutes I was about uh, two to 3,000 zombies. What do you know kind of what you kill? I mean, I've played this game so goddamn much like <coughs> I, I mean you know as a, as a writer uh, you might think that we spend a lot of time you know writing scripts um, but really uh, <laughs> what we do the most is playing the game to make sure that what we've written actually makes sense in that moment um, and especially uh, especially a lot of um, helping the mission scripters or mission designers to uh, make sure that that stuff's triggering in the right place, and that I mean, the timing can make so much of a difference to the, the way something impacts you. So, I mean, it, and but so fractured, you know, you yeah. just load up into some weird part of the game, and you play through, and you you, know, you shut it down, and you start over again, shut it down, start it over again. That I mean, I, I mean, I've played untold hours of the game. I mean, probably a thousand. I don't even know. I wouldn't. I couldn't even be able to guess. I mean, you. I play this game. You know, when we were working on it, play this game just like all day. All day, you know, <laughs> however many hours of overtime. And the number of zombies that I've killed in this game must be in the millions by this point. I mean, it's just it's just continuous. That I'm only just now sitting down to play the whole game the whole way through at home. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even. I'm handing it to my wife. and being, She's doing it. So I couldn't even tell you. I could um, not even tell you. So a couple people are asking about uh, uh, bugs we've, uh, we've seen. And we've had a few uh, reports of... Uh, Different issues. The the shelter one's the one they're asking about. Uh, we're aware of it. We're looking into it. Uh, we don't have any news on that. What bug is that? That's time. Um, it, uh, an issue with uh, the shelter level resets. Oh yeah. Uh, right. We're looking into to that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any, you know, firm announcement for that. Um, I am also the wrong guy to ask about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Extremely the wrong guy. You know, Jeff's uh, Jeff is the writer. He's not uh, involved in the, the bug. Uh, process now. One thing that's always, uh, I think, is surprising to people is just how much text there are in modern games. Um, and I've been here nine months, and when I was first here, we, you were still doing some of the writing. Um, and because we have the same first name, sort of, um, 
some people people would include me on the emails meaning to include you so I would get an email saying we need uh, eight pieces of text for the museum or we need uh, these ten lines for this character things like that do you have any estimate of uh, just how much uh, text you write for a game depends on the game I know that I mean on Deus Ex I wrote uh, God I don't even know like just books <laughs> books of stuff about the about the science of the augmentations and all that on this game we wrote dossier entries yeah. um, quest updates um, descriptions of all manner of things let's take a look you know all these little um, I'm gonna point but you can't see me point <laughs> you know the the descriptions that you see on the map there yeah um, for the for the objective uh, markers as well as descriptions for the stores although I will point out that Ed, uh, Ed Agostini wrote a lot of these and then we updated them um, or, or you know proofread them even just just barely um, but there are other things you know like all these case file descriptions tons and tons of that content we wrote um, you know uh, every single one of the little uh, uh, abilities here uh, if we didn't write it ourselves we edited it quite a lot uh, probably with Victor the game designer who's in charge of that um, there's nothing on this page. This is all pretty pictures. Uh, the dossier. Now these things. Are, this is this is the um, this is like the real uh, height of in-game text. Is writing all these journals. Uh, these um, uh, we say like um, kind of like different collectible items that had text. Um, a lot of them are like newspaper articles, or a lot of them are actually uh, audio recordings. So they have actual dialogue in them. Um, all of all of Vic's logs. I don't want to ruin those for you because a lot of them have story stuff in them. Um, I don't. I don't think I ever actually counted how many that we did. Usually, yeah. I have these numbers at the top of my head, but sometimes you're working on things so fast, you're just getting it done. You're not. You're not, you're not getting ready to gloat about yeah. how much work you did. But just, I mean, it's actually a. I would say this is a lean design for the amount of content that we have in the background, text-wise. We don't have any kind of, like, giant Dragon Age books that you pick up or, right. you know. We didn't really do anything like that. We tried to keep it lean and keep it real action-y real fast. Um, here's an excellent piece of text. It's one of my favorites. Uh, this is one of our concept artists, Kissing Bryce. Uh, this image has been in the game since since uh, since we did a, a vertical slice, which is, you know, an early demo of the game. Uh, where we had this apartment was uh, owned by two lovely men who lived together uh, named Corey and Andy. <laughs> Corey and Andy. And this is part of the story, but again, you know, as usual, the story edits. The story, yeah. the story edits. The story changes over time. Um, this is, yeah, this is Bryce, our executive director, um, and uh, John, one of our concept artists. Lovely photo. Um, but it, that actually was relevant in the story at one point, but now is no longer. Yeah, it was just sort of background, uh, just, just world back building, stuff. background stuff. You know, there's there's some indications about the people who you actually used to live in this apartment, um, which was something we, you know, we we didn't do too a lot of. I wish we I wish we had done a lot more of really of really building in stories to each in, each individual environment. Most of that stuff that you get that environmental story is uh, is all in the collectibles. All right, I like the sweater. Yep, uh, and the comfortable game designer shoes. Yeah. I don't uh, necessarily agree with the game designer sh uh, shirt that uh, you find in the mall, which is kind of a purpley shirt. I don't necessarily think that's game designer. It's not appropriate because it's not extra extra large. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to. The messenger bag, though, that comes with it is a good uh, good uh, touch. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, uh, no current questions. Um, is Megan's bat in the game from Walking Dead? I oh. Yes, Negan. Um, there is a baseball bat in the game. Um, it is not exactly the Negan type bat oh. uh, that uh, that you see. I screwed up. I'm going back. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, you have to listen to the radio. Talking and playing is uh, harder than you think. Talking about myself and playing is really hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> the voice actor that you're about to hear. Um, <clears throat> edited his dialogue a lot, uh, actually adding in so so many mother effers that we had to do a lot of editing on this guy. Uh, and I don't remember why he ended up being Australian. We actually joked about this guy. He appears to be 
Australian, Latin American, Japanese. But <laughs> you know, as the you know, in the way that stories go, stories and games go, things change a lot. And sometimes you just have to make do with what what you ended up with. <coughs> <coughs> I think that might be our only motherfucker in the entire game. Whoops. Was I supposed to, should I say that? Oh, well. Uh, I guess the dialogue fine. says it. We, we started with an uh, ESRB rating. Okay, good. Good. Uh, Curtis wants to see some vehicle action, so we'll get to a vehicle. You got it. Where's a vehicle? <clears throat> if we get around. Um, there wasn't a vehicle there when I jumped down. I don't understand. So just a reminder, um, we've mentioned it a couple times. A lot of people haven't, uh, haven't played through the game. Some people are just... Uh, watching this uh, for the first time. Uh, it would be great if you guys could not talk about anything past Case 2, which is what we're playing now, just to avoid spoiling it for people who either haven't had a chance to play through it yet or even pick it up. Um, you know, I'm really hoping that we can get up to the dam, though. <coughs> Sorry, not the dam, but bef you know, a little bit before the dam, because Hammond is the character that I was really interested in, in talking about a little bit. Because that is a character that grew leaps and bounds uh, through the course of us trying to figure out what Frank's journey was. Um, the character of Hammond <coughs> was initially a janitor in the mall. Uh, hearkening back to a character from Dead Rising 1. Uh, she was not a man uh, in the original versions of the story, but became one over time. Sorry. <laughs> the other way around. Became a woman over time. <coughs> Uh, and was not a black woman, but was a elderly white man, if I recall. Um, and uh, it's it's an example of, of uh, <clears throat> a situation that I that I try to pay attention to and, and deal with often, which is trying to make sure that you've got <clears throat> you're not accidentally saying something with your characterization and their ethnicity and their gender uh, in a way that really gets you in trouble. Um, I discovered at one point that we had three Asian characters that were all villainous in an earlier part of the story. And in fact, all of the Asian characters were villainous in that, in that particular moment in the story. So uh, and what I ended up doing to make sure that I hadn't done anything like that, just to make sure that people didn't think for some reason we were saying that all Asian, all Asian people were villainous or had a predilection towards being villainous, was I made this magnificent chart that had all the characters and all their motivations and their ethnicities and genders all kind of like mashed together. Um, and to see like what we were saying about our character, what we were saying about people with our characterization, and Hammond's Hammond's uh, Hammond's characterization and her her you know uh, stats such as her her, um, uh, you know, her like racial background, her age, her uh, gender, and all of that all like swapped so many times. Not not just Hammond, but but almost every character swapped many times except Frank, obviously. Um, so we could arrive at a situation where <clears throat> it seemed like we weren't uh, saying something nasty about any particular group uh, that we didn't want to, that we didn't want to say. We wanted to say something nasty about zombies and paramilitary groups, and we wanted to leave it at that. So, yeah, it, it was just really interesting seeing that like matrix breaking down the characters, their motivations, who they were, what they were, you know, wh where they were from, what it seemed, what we seemed like we were saying, their accents, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Such a huge, huge deal when you're making a uh, when you're making a, a game in a game world like this, and, and I hate to say the p word, but when you're making a product, you're you're making something that you want people to play and enjoy and feel good about. It's a it's a big consideration, and it took a lot of it took a lot of thinking and a lot of work with concept artists and character artists. Hammond is Hammond is a very is a really uh, is an exciting journey actually getting to who she ended up being, especially since uh, Frank is such a dick to her early on in the story, as many people have commented on. I've seen in in forums and stuff. <clears throat> I think Hammond might be my favorite character. I keep, I keep saying someone's my favorite character, and I keep changing my mind. Um, so what is... Uh, so Frank is obviously one of the few established characters in the game. Uh, Brad's briefly appeared before. Um, you, obviously, we talked... We did a stream uh, for the 10th anniversary re-release of the original Dead Rising uh, about you guys playing through the original game several times, kind of getting to know Frank and kind of figuring that out. What, uh, how do you update Frank in terms of it's been 15 years um, in game time mm -hmm. um, since uh, the first uh, outbreak of Willamette, kind of since the first game? Um, how do you, 
How do you figure out where Frank's been and where he is today? <laughs> we looked at the old games and extrapolated naturally. Um, we looked at who he was in Dead Rising 1 and what his ambitions and his motivations were about, what he cared about. Um, we looked at OTR, even though I know that off the record is supposed to be off the record, but we looked at it anyway. Um, whether it's off the record or not, I think is a matter of debate. Um, we looked at Case West. Um, we looked at all these things, and we, we looked at there, and we thought, what, does, what do all those things say about wh who Frank would have become? And where everything was pointing was fall from grace. <clears throat> and see, everything was saying that, that Frank had uh, tried to capitalize on the discoveries and the things that he'd made in Dead Rising 1, uh, almost all to his, uh, to his, to his shame. Uh, very, we suggest, especially in ODR, that <clears throat> uh, he, he tried to um, kind of make a career out of his beliefs that, that the government, it was all a government conspiracy, that Willamette was a government conspiracy, and there's a lot of other indications that, that most of that failed and it ended up being an embarrassment for him. So we're like, okay, so this guy was very ambitious when he was, when he was a young guy, very ambitious about what he wanted to do, what he was hoping he would achieve as a journalist, and it all seemed like he'd blown it. It seemed like he'd messed up his chance. So we're like, so who is going to be the guy? Uh, and what we, what we decided, who's going to be the guy for, for Dead Rising 4? What is Frank going to be like? And we said the things that we really liked about him is he's got like a pretty dry sense of humor. Um, he does seem to actually really care about people. Um, but he's also very, very focused on, on getting the story, and he's got a little bit of that like paparazzo quality to him. So where we thought that he would evolve from there is the paparazzo would get would would uh, he would have been he would have been kind of embarrassed about that ultimately and a little pissed off that no one had really believed him when he very well knew the truth but was unable to prove it. So we added a little bit of that like jaded quality. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, you hear that when he's talking with Vic early on. He's talking about um, you know uh, I don't know if anybody's really noticed. I haven't seen anybody comment on it. But has anybody wondered about like why his camera was was in a closet and was locked away? She broke into the. She had to break into his closet to get his camera out. That doesn't seem like something that that Frank West would do. Frank would have his camera like with him all the time, but we said that it was locked away. He'd put it away, and he also tells Brad that he'd quit because uh, the 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 outbreaks and his outbreak journalism had brought him nothing in his life. You see him teaching a, a night class at the beginning. Uh, it's a wedding photography class. I mean, like he's at the lowest point you, a photographer can be at the beginning of the game. Um, Vic only sort of tricks him into coming out, saying, saying he doesn't really think that whatever she's got is going to be all that interesting, but when he's out there, it is interesting, and he gets back into it. But then the way that she behaves kind of screws him over, and he goes back to being bitter and jaded, and he really just wants to quit. Um, what the, the, the hopes and dreams he'd had about, about what his career was going to be like were not there anymore. So that's, that's how Frank ended up the way that he is here. He's still that wisecracking guy, um, but, but he's even even a little more wisecracky because he's, he's, he's more pissed off about it. I mean, I think, I'm sure people can sense that he's got a little bit of sadness in him about the way that his life and his career has gone. That, that we tried to amplify, to try to give him a place to grow from. Um, and the place to grow from that we put him at is he's, he's only in this to get back what he could not get out of the, the first incidents of Willamette and the previous, uh, the previous outbreaks to get that fame and that glory that he was trying to get last time that he didn't get, that he, that he, that he screwed up on. So that's why, that, that's who he is now. The, the wisecracking and the jokes are really uh, more an indication of the pain that he feels about how, about how poorly he messed up his own career. I would love to hear anybody's comment on that because that was, that was a big goal for me was to try to make him feel like he was going to do anything, he was going to screw anybody over just to get to get, to get to get things going the way that he wanted in his life. All right, and uh, here, what does, the, so video game writing is obviously different than any other type of writing. You go to a movie and it's going to be two hours long, give or take, and the writer has some confidence that the movie is going to play out in a certain order, um, there's going to be a narrative flow. Uh, the character's not going to be dressed as a fire uh, firefighter <laughs> or wearing yeah. a, a serve bot helmet. Yeah. Um, what the is summer dress is my yeah. my personal favorite. What is the uh, kind of how do you address the fact that as soon as a as soon as a player gets the game, you really have They're no control mess it over up. yeah, yeah <laughs> over so, how it plays. So like my first couple weeks when I was on the job, the first thing I started with was what is what is the what's the What's the tone of the story we want? And the unifying consensus is that 
it should be a little bit goofy to a certain degree. We shouldn't try to take things way too seriously. Now, admittedly, we do get kind of dramatic here and there with, with uh, uh, especially the interactions with Vic, uh, and especially that college scene with Brad, where Brad kind of enumerates his failings and tries to tries to coax him out of out of uh, being a quitter. Um, but a lot of his, uh, but we wanted to balance it with that thing, with with that quality of Dead Rising that we like, which is that it's really like a, it's just a goofball fantasy most most of the way. So Frank making lots of wisecracks and jokes about it, keeping things light the whole way through, was, was something we really wanted. It also played in well to what we hoped was a sense that Frank is really like, you know, uh, a guy that isn't too proud of himself anymore. That he's a little bit self-deprecating now and then, like, yeah, a little bit of that quality. So we so we wanted to keep it kind of light and goofy, even though you could sense at the core he, he's, he's got some pain that he's dealing with. So yeah, that that's, that, that's how we tried to balance it. I mean, the... The desire and the request, you know, from the people in charge of the project were make it a journalism mystery about serious stuff. So that's that's what we tried to do. We tried to balance that. Give him a good personal motivation, give him give him some darkness that he's dealing with. Um, but also try to make sure that, that it, it doesn't seem completely ridiculous that he would that he's doing this kind of thing. I mean now obviously you can't have you can't have a character in a cinema responding to Frank wearing all kinds of different clothes, dressed as a penguin. You know, we just can't do that. Yeah. So, like in classic Dead Rising fashion, we just kind of try to ignore it and let it be fun for when the when the player is when the player character is discovered, you know, wearing something completely ridiculous in a scene where they should be absolutely serious. Um, and that's that's just sort of where we left it. But we didn't want the we didn't want the 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 feel of the story to completely ignore the ridiculousness. Yeah. And that was our goal. That was the goal. It's a, it's a tough world to work in to make to make uh to make all of our cinematic moments absolutely believable. Commander, I found this civilian messing around with one of our computers. And here we have Darcy. Uh, best tweet I've uh, seen about Darcy was uh, a fellow tweeted uh, a selfie from Frank um, in front of Darcy and uh, along with a picture of his father and he says that moment when uh, my father is in Dead Rising 4, and it was almost identical uh, wow. between how Darcy looked and how uh, how this uh, player's father looked. I hope I hope that this player's father wasn't a complete twit because Darcy is probably the most ridiculous, ill-equipped character <laughs> to deal with an apocalypse in the whole game. At least Frank's wearing something uh, fire retardant at the moment. One thing that bugs me about games when I'm playing them a lot is that in uh, in really hardcore gameplay segments like this one, oftentimes the uh, the voice of your character completely disappears and is replaced only by the mechanics and the animation, and you have no sense of what that person is feeling or thinking um, <clears throat> during you know a hardcore moment like this. You know, I played Wolfenstein recently, the the remake. And everybody made a big deal about how great the, um, you know, the story was. Uh, the story was, and I agree. I thought the story was fun. It was really great and and uh, engaging in a lot of parts. And man, great sex! Whew. <laughs> Can we do a game with sex next time, please? Um, but um, but then the character often just sort of like just drains away, and you, you don't get any sense of being a person reacting to what's going on naturally. So um, I always try to make sure that even in a battle like this. <laughs> Your character hasn't, Frank, for example, hasn't completely disappeared, um, replaced by nothing but a game of checkers that you're just trying to figure out. A lot of the time, too, we'll even uh, we'll we'll write lots of comment or lots of dialogue for a character to deal with. You know, when an enemy is at like half health or something like that, or when he's reduced you to half health, um, <coughs> and we'll have those you know be custom scripted in the moment. And sometimes we'll even write like five or six times the amount of dialogue that we actually need because we know that you're going to die, or we hope you yeah. will. Um, in a in a, a mini boss fight like that or a boss fight, so that when you play it again, when you reload, you've got a little bit of new experience um, as the character says different things, stuff you didn't expect them to say, um, and the entire situation feels a little fresh to you every time. And that's that's like so cheap from the perspective of game development. You're in the studio and you write a bunch of lines for a guy and he says them and they're like you know they cost pennies each, but for the player who dies and has to relive this, you know, a difficult fight potentially many times over and over again, 
they've got something that's there to like make it more rewarding for them in that moment. <clears throat> Dialogue is, you know, so cheap. Just one or two or three or six lines makes like no difference to the budget, but it makes a huge difference to the to the experience of the fight. All right, thank you, Paula. I don't know if it actually ended up in the game, but uh, later on you find Paula and Darcy hiding out in a shelter somewhere. And uh, if you walk up to them, uh, Darcy, uh, Paula makes some kind of comment about uh, about uh, about Darcy being her boyfriend, and he's all like flabbergasted. He's like, "Oh, are we dating again? Oh, cool!" And she's like, "Shut up! I'm trying it out." Or something. She makes some kind of throwaway comment about it. And I just love how smitten uh, Darcy is with Paula. Like she's some big wig, uh, you know, like she's some um, really important journalist, and he's just full. He's just like gaga for her. I'm not actually sure it's in the game anymore, though. Hey, have to, we'll have to, we'll have to check. I honestly think it's some kind of <coughs> zombie monster. monster. Um, what other characters yeah, have you enjoyed uh, writing on this? I guess we can maybe talk a bit. Uh, do you have much to say about Brad? I mean, he comes in fairly early. He's, Brad, yeah. He's what, uh, aside from Vic, he's what pulls Frank into into everything. But Brad's kind of like, I mean, I guess if you want to get all Heroes Journey, but he's a little bit of the mentor. You know, he's the guy that comes in and says, like, you really should go on this quest. You should really go and do this thing. Uh, and gives him all the motivation he really needs. Comes and delivers him all that motivation. Um, and then throughout the whole rest of the story, he's, he's sort of like your, uh, your sounding board and, and a character that helps you make sense of what your next objective should be. Um, and talks through a bunch of stuff with you and is also involved a little bit in Frank's arc, which I won't talk about because it really gets, you know, really gets moving a little further into the game, really more in Case 4, actually. Um, but Brad is like, he was one of our favorite characters from uh, from the previous games. He was in a, he was a DLC character from DR3, um, <coughs> one of the ones that people liked more. And if I recall, I believe it was one of Microsoft's requests about the character, about the characters that Brad would be in it. So that was a really fun character to get to, to bring into the story. Now, I actually really do wish that we'd involved him a little better. Um, he appears in the beginning, and he seems to be really involved. Uh, and he's also, he also seems to have like a pretty good, pretty good insights about who Frank is and really what moves him and what drives him. Um, but then he kind of just fades away a little bit. And it's not, it's not. I wish it was something that we had taken a little more time to figure out. But you know, as with most games, there's there's a very limited amount of time to figure out a lot of the very very broad story stuff because the cinematics team needs to get moving and the mission's got to get designed, and that takes you know a year or two years um, <coughs> and you you very often don't have a lot of time to figure out <laughs> certainly don't have like a, a, an award winning screenplay's worth of time to figure out how you know how, what, what the plot beats should be and how they all work together beautifully uh, Brad is one of the guys that suffered I think so in the chat Curtis asks uh, a question we kind of covered so I'll just run through it quickly uh, Jeffrey did uh, he was the lead writer on the Dead Rising 4 he had not worked on a previous Dead Rising game uh, though he did the latest uh, Deus Ex. How do you say that? Deus Ex. Oh, I, I could not work there because I could not pronounce it. Or Day of Sex, as we used to call um, it. And some uh, previous other games. Um, but uh, this is his first outing as a lead writer on uh, Dead Rising. And, Good uh, Lord, what's the question with that preamble? Uh, no, that was... Uh, oh, that was... Uh, whether, uh, Who's this guy? If you're doing any more in the future. Um, and we're not talking about uh, kind of what's... What's beyond Dead Rising 4? Uh, it's a little early for that. Um, Kevin asks if it's out for PC. It is. It's out on Windows 10, and you can get that through the Windows 10 store. And, uh, yeah, here. Uh, let's talk. No, I was going to. Not Frank. Uh, let's talk a bit about uh, Tom. Tom, yeah. So Tom is leading a resistance or uh, kind of a group of survivors, anyway. Tom's definitely one of my favorites. Uh, he's another character that evolved quite a lot. Uh, well, actually, you know what? I'll say he actually didn't evolve as much as many of the other characters. He was always, uh, you know, like the leader of a survivor militia. Um, he was trying to put together his own kind of, you know, survivor utopia. Um, you learn a lot more about him as the story goes on, that he's got a pretty good motivation for being here. Uh, he's got a real dark mindset about how the New World Order should be run. Um, man, his, his teeth are terrifying, aren't they, sometimes? 
Um, <clears throat> it's funny, we have maniacs in the game, and they're, they, were, they were our replacements for psychos, but Tom is the real psycho in this game. I mean, he's, he's like, you know, uh, and he, he's the way that I would, I, would, I would really like to do psychos if we had a future opportunity. Built up with a lot, a lot of story, a character in his own right, a, a, you know, like a, a piece of the puzzle of the main story. Um, rather than kind of like an insert, which is what a lot of, which is what the psychos felt like a lot to me in the past. I would love it. I would, and in fact, I think it's story's job to make sure that when you come up into a fight with someone, a boss, a mini boss, you've got a lot of reason to hate them, and you really, you've got every reason in the world to try to rip their head off. Tom, you do, because he's a real bad guy, especially from, you know, in this scene, you get a real sense that he's a sicko and a weirdo. Um, you know, he threatens us. He puts the axe right to our throat, and holds our camera hostage and and uh, you know you can tell that he's a you can tell that he's a bad man early on and our uh, mocap actor nailed it with the the body language here look at him he's just like Ugh. Uh, it's creepy I don't like that guy um, so one thing uh, obviously this is the fourth dead rising game um, but zombies I mean since uh, kind of since I'm not gonna say it's because of the first dead rising game but Certainly, in the past ten years or so, zombies have become uh, they've become much bigger than they were um, physically. Physically, they're yeah. giant now. They're one thing uh, I've read, uh, or actually I heard it on a podcast interview with Robert Kirkman, is that he does not uh, the writer of The Walking Dead. He does not play zombie video games. He doesn't read zombie books. He avoids zombies altogether. So that he's not influenced by other medium. Do you have? How do you bring fresh stuff to a zombie game when zombies are everywhere? They're on TV. They're in movies, and almost it seems everything you could do with a zombie has been done. Or, well, we're lucky in that uh, Dead Rising has its own lore and its own way of how zombies came about. I mean, like I said, I just worked on Prototype Two and. Those are science zombies, right? Um, Walking Dead, we don't really know yet whether they're science zombies or supernatural zombies or, well, we don't really know. I mean, they, they, they take pains to make sure we don't know in that one. Um, but it really does seem like zombies fall into two camps, supernatural zombies and science zombies. We have science zombies, but we also have our own kind of odd twist on it, which, which you know, sections off our own little section of zombie lore, and, and, and we use that as our own. So... That's something that I wanted to double down on, is make sure that we were using Dead Rising's own zombie lore and not trying to go out anywhere weird with it, just trying to own what we've got and develop it just a little bit. Later on, uh, and I won't ruin it, but later on, oh, maybe I'll ruin it a little. Uh, later on, you find out that the story has quite a lot to do with Barnaby, who was a scientist from DR1, um, that, that is the guy who we say invented zombieism, although it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, but that's, that's the shorthand that a lot of characters use to describe his, his uh, involvement with zombies. Um, and how uh, the parasites are involved, but how they like lodge themselves in your brain, about how our zombies are not actually dead, they're actually just people that are basically driven nuts. Um, yeah, and it, that's, I mean, uh, what, what did I use for, what did I use for my, uh, my inspiration? I didn't, I didn't really use much, I just, I just owned what we had, what, what the previous games had set up, and tried to build on that just a little bit. Um, to give us a new little interesting twist on 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 Barnaby's uh, work and and where they came from, and Santa Cabeza and and all the science that that that, that was involved in that. Um, I thought that if there was anything, I mean, on the one hand, we don't have to rip off anyone else, and we we didn't have to come up with something totally bizarre. We could just we could just own what we had. And that always seems like the best idea for me with an IP. I mean, if we've got something unique, we should own that. So that's 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 why I wanted to go in, in the direction that we ended up we ended up going. Uh, one character we saw um, and actually talked to, but uh, didn't really get into, is uh, Isaac. Like is there much uh, Isaac? <laughs> and and he, uh, he's also in the co-op. He's one of the, the band of uh, survivors. Yep. Working with Hammond. So we have four survivors that work with Hammond that are kind of like our good, kind of like our kind of like our. Um, our allies, and that's Connor, who's the uh, <laughs> the uh, guy we meet in the mall. You find out that he was working at the mall as a um, 
What the heck was he? He was like a front desk guy. I can't speak yeah, the word right now. Yeah, he was at the hotel. Right uh, concierge? He was like the concierge at the, at the mall. Although, if you read his stuff, he, you see that he wanted to be the bartender. But they wouldn't let him. Um, <laughs> you can read some of his drink recipes as well in the collectibles. And they're all really, they sound really stupid. Um, we basically just had a lot of fun making fun of older hipsters with that character. Isaac is a poet and a butcher. Um, you can read some of his poetry in the collectibles. Um... There's also some hints here and there about his being a butcher. We realized we'd never decided where it was that he worked. So we decided that he worked at the Sausage Hut in the mall a little while ago. It's funny, Shannon and I, uh, working on this, we, we realize often that we kind of have our own little headcanon about what you know what all the characters are up to. Um, and that that never actually made it into the game. <laughs> so I have to be careful about what I say sometimes. Um, but yeah, then there's... Uh, who's the other guy? Jessa is uh, we, she was a mechanic. Um, that's why you see her initially helping you with the uh, combo vehicle. Uh, that was actually just luck. We said that she was a mechanic, but never really had any reason for her to be one in the story until suddenly we realized we needed to tutorialize combo vehicles. And we're like, oh, well, it'll have to be Jessa. So we got her in there. Jordan, we also said she was a mining tech. <coughs> and um, that's why she ends up helping you blow up all kinds of stuff in the story. It's funny, with those characters, uh, these four right here, actually, they didn't exist uh, at all until uh, we started working on our co-op stuff, uh, and the co-op uh, producer really wanted the um, really wanted to have the characters that you could play also be present in the main story. So that was a really annoying challenge. <laughs> it was like, oh well, we've already written the story, so how are we going to add them in? <clears throat> but they'd already secured the ability to um, to have four new characters designed. Um, so. You know, most of the costs that you'd have to deal with with just coming up with a character out of nowhere were already dealt with. That's a, I mean, you think like, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if everybody thinks this, but writing a story for a game is, is so not the same as writing a, a movie uh, or writing a novel. Every single damn thing you come up with that you want to have um, has a cost associated to it. A cost in that we have to... You know, we have to um, sometimes pay somebody. No, I don't mean an employee, but, you know, like pay a, a voice actor to do that performance. We sometimes have to pay an outsourcer to make a prop or something that we need. Oftentimes, we need to make sure we even have an employee on hand who can actually do the damn thing that you're requesting. Uh, and, of course, making a brand new character model is, is extremely expensive. Um, you know, a lot of the time, as soon as I start a game, the first question I ask is, Okay, the most important thing I need to know, guys, is w how many lines can we record? Because that translates into how many lines you can record in a single session of dialogue, which translates into a direct cost somewhere in the... Uh, Jody, you'll give me crap for this. I, you know what I'm not going to say. Yeah. Um, somewhere in the vicinity of many thousands of dollars, um, usually for a half-day session. Um, and we know very well how much money we want to spend on our voice recording. So that automa you divide all that, that tells you exactly how many characters you can have in the story. Because a lot of time, too, voice actors, depending on, you know, d depending on your contract with them, w will only agree to do a certain number of character voices within a single session. So that, that right there tells you exactly what kind of story you can make, whether you're going to make a big, crazy, epic story with lots and lots of characters, or whether you need to make something really tight and controlled, like what we got with DR4. Um, we knew early on that we had... You know, a cast of characters that was not going to be like Witcher 3. It was going to be... Every single thing has a cost. It was interesting to have to add these four new characters in. Um, working on the co-op design. Um, and have to just, you know, come up with personalities for them and try to figure out how to insert them into the storyline. It was a huge challenge. Um, but they ended up being four really kind of fun characters, and they have a little bit of basis, and uh, they have a little bit of characterization to help, you know, make the co-op feel like it was actually part of the story of Willamette, and not just some kind of weird side thing, like, I don't know, you know, some games do. Far Cry. <laughs> some games. All right, we're running here. Um, so that Hammond scene, I talked all the way through it, and that was, that was, the, thing I I, that was the reason I wanted to play this case. He's such a dick to her, and everybody was really concerned about that. You know, we did... A lot of focus test on that on the earlier part of the game, especially especially case two, and um, a, a lot of people were like, "Ooh, Frank, he was really mean to her." You know, she tries, to, he he goes to her thinking that she's gonna help him, and when she does help him, he turns around and abandons her and just leaves her there. 
The idea being that we wanted to present Frank as a guy who was mostly there for his own motivations, to try to get the story, um, to do his job, to win back the glory that he'd lost. You know, most of these are all really, really selfish reasons. And that, that's the, the strongest presentation of his selfishness that I think we have in the game. And it really bothered a lot of people, and it worried a lot of people on our team. And um, But we s never really got to a point where we thought it was too much. Um, so we just left it. Just like, yeah, okay, our main character is being a real jerk to someone who's apparently a very nice person. And that's clearly not a way to make a character who's likable. It's funny, I read a lot of the press, and even though a lot of the press is very positive about Frank, they often do say things like, <clears throat> he's not very likable, although I enjoyed playing him a lot. Um, they're definitely talking about that scene with Hammond. So, um, while it was, I think, not conventional, uh, and, and certainly risky to, to have our main character be such a jerk, and be so selfish, and even endanger other people that appear to be good people, um, our goal was to try to show that Frank was imperfect, and that he was flawed, and that he had things he needed to improve about himself. Um, and... Judging by, judging by the reviews, the way people respond to Frank, um, it, it does seem like, it seemed like we achieved that. And even just now, I still feel nervous talking about it, because it's, it's not a thing that you do to make a character likable. Of course, the desire is always, you know, to, to just make your character cool and make him really likable, and like he's got all the right things to say all the time. But that does not create characters that people really enjoy seeing. People really actually do enjoy seeing people who sometimes are total fuck-ups and do things the wrong way. And don't 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 think about things the right way. And you look at them, and you just shake your head, you're like, "Oh, what an idiot! God, what a jerk!" Um, but that also makes us smile and makes us like them better, especially when we can kind of sense that there's going to be an arc for them, that they're going to change and develop and become a better person, which is exactly what happens with Frank. I'm I mean, cool. Hammond is the vehicle of that to a certain degree. <coughs> I'm glad I played through this case earlier today because. I spent, considering I'd played through it before, a couple of weeks ago, I spent a seen amount of time in the dark here trying to figure out where the light switch was. Uh, it's right there for future reference. <laughs> uh, Darcy. Uh, Hammond is also, uh, uh, along with Brad, I'd say one of the most competent characters in the game. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment? Darcy? Yeah. I mean... Or sorry, not Darcy. Hammond. Hammond is utterly the most competent. Um, we don't, I don't think we ever say it anywhere, I'm not sure, but our, our background for her is that she was in the Navy, she was a Navy engineer. She states that she was a city engineer, um, but if you look closely, she has Navy tattoos on her arm and some cinemas where you can see her, see her skin. <coughs> um, she's absolutely built for this kind of situation and is a much better leader than Tom. Tom is a selfish tyrant, uh, really all about, like, building himself up as a king, whereas Hammond is just all about, like, let's get the crap out of this place and actually leads the people out. If you read the collectibles and stuff, she's presented almost as a superhero sometimes. Um, yeah. Darcy is utterly... It's like, close on the heels of the Hammond scene. Frank also leaves. Sit tight, Darcy. You'll be safe here, probably. What? Frank also leaves. And Frank is tied up too. When who knows what is attacking. Later on, Brad is like, uh, oh, actually, I think we cut this line. But we had a line with Brad where he says, um, "No, it's still actually, in there." Pause for a sec because I want to talk about this. Uh, about that was going through the dam here because this was a real fun challenge from narrative design perspective. Um, Frank, uh, <laughs> saying that I forgot what I was going to talk about. Play on, continue. <laughs> Going through the dam. Going through the dam was fun. We really, uh, this is one of our more like uh, richer, more carefully designed experiences. Phil was the mission designer on this, and he kicked its butt. Um, clearly something is going on on the top of the dam. You know, when he's talking to Darcy, we see like there's dust filtering down from above, and we can hear explosions and stuff. Um, but it's all, you can't see any of it. All, all, you can, all you can see are these soldiers here and there, and that's it. When he's standing around back there at the, at the chain link fence inside, you can look inside the dam, you see the explosions above and dirt filtering down from above and lights flickering and all that. It was a lot of work to get this narrative uh, to flow, to get all the little triggers in that we needed. Like you can hear the guys talking about what's going on up on top of the dam. You can hear the radio going off now and then. We had this very, uh, this, like uh, some of the more complex uh, narrative design we did, we had a map where we, 
you know, indicated as the player walked through this area. You would hear this little bit of dialogue or this little bit of dialogue or like this audio would trigger here and there. Um, <clears throat> it's actually more of an FPS level, really, uh, than, than we did anywhere else. And it really, uh, it really, uh, it's just, it's all just really like kind of tightly done. We thought about the duration of dialogue and how the player would be able to hear all the things that were going on. Uh, and Phil got it all in perfectly and designed it all perfectly to fit. Um, and it actually generates this real feeling like <coughs> something exciting is going on up there. Uh, and it's really a good, it's really a testament to how, how, how well you can use just like a couple lines of dialogue here and there to really give a sense of, of danger and excitement about what's going on, even when virtually nothing is going on if you're walking through a hallway shooting a bunch of guys. What? What did you just stick that grenade to? I, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this whole, uh, this level two is just so like a, like a shooter. Uh, lots of guys hiding in corners, shooting at you, smoke grenades, smoke grenades, flash grenades. Um, this is the worst gun. <laughs> that could be, uh, there we go, this is much better. This excites, this whole bit excites me because I've, I'm a big shooter fan too, you know, like I'm playing through playing through Mankind Divided right now and totally loving it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's just a tense sequence through here. Alright. Guys popping out from places you don't expect them to be, a little tight, little tight quarters, which is, you know, for, a, for an open world game, we do tight quarters combat really well. And these jerks with the shields. And, uh... We got anything else? Can we take over for a sec? Sure. <coughs> can I walk in there and wail on these guys? You can if you uh, think you can pull it off. Oh, I won't cheat with the Blambo. I know. <coughs> uh, so let's check. Uh, I'm going to pop over to Twitch see what the, uh, what's going on there. And Facebook. Bryce is going to be mad at me for saying I'm cheating with the blowing bow. <laughs> <coughs> you know, our combo weapons are great, obviously. Yes. The huge spectacle of them. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not a anywhere near uh, being involved with the people who really work on our combat design, but... I really do enjoy uh, also the, the basic weapons. You know, the really the simple stuff like a baseball bat. Uh, the the submachine guns are great because they're just so out of control and crazy. Um, <clears throat> and when you run down, you get down to nothing but having a knife, and it just suddenly gets really tense. Like you feel like there's no way I'm going to survive this. You know, having you know playing through and testing the game lots, you don't get a lot of time to actually use the combo weapons, so it's probably. Probably part of what uh, makes me feel like I love just using a fire axe sometimes. And Here we go. Um, so the lieutenant, uh, this is his big, uh, big scene. He doesn't really, does he even have dialogue in the game? Uh, he has a little. You hear him on the radio a lot. <coughs> um, his voice on the radio is a lot of what this case too about letting us know what's going on with their search for the monster, which we presume is what they've got in this safe... <laughs> Um, <laughs> you got him in the fireman's outfit. Yeah, I would have. Uh, I would have changed if I had a a chance to find a mirror. We needed a we needed a mirror in the uh, in the dam's locker room or something. Um, yeah. So this guy's na actual name is James Caballero. Caballero. He's Japanese, <laughs> and he has an Australian accent. I don't even know. How that happened, honestly. It uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a Japanese population in Australia. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. What? Uh, which character was the hardest to write for in the game for you, anyway? <clears throat> you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about who Frank was going to be. So when it came down to writing him, it was a pleasure, which is the right way to do it. Um, so who was the hardest to write for? Calder, definitely. Um, he was an unusual, uh, an unusual character in the beginning. Uh, as, uh, mm, I don't want to give it away. 
Let's not talk about Calder, because I, I, I have to give details of the plot away uh, in order to uh, in order to talk about why he's difficult to difficult to write for. Um, who was difficult? Initially, I found Hammond a little difficult because while while we had to, while she had a really great role in the story, being the guy uh, being the person that kind of um, takes Frank out of his selfishness. Uh, just, just, just by being who she is, not not because she thought he needed to be a better person, like Brad. You kind of get that sense from Brad sometimes. Brad's trying to, trying to dad him into being a better guy, um, and and sort of like you know pushes his buttons now and then to try to make him a better guy. Um, but Hammond, we didn't really know what her characterization was supposed to be initially, um, and ultimately she just became kind of like that good person, you know, like the. Just the kind of like heart of gold will help anyone. Oh, I do not like this fight. It's too hard. I sound like a wolf saying that, and everybody's saying that. to a certain degree the game's too easy. But I actually find this fight difficult. Just uh, sure well, went through a lot of iterations as we were working on it. Um, this this playthrough I'm on uh, case five already, so Frank's been leveled up a little bit. So okay, things. Oh, he's 57. Okay, cool. <laughs> things are a little. If easier. I die now, I'll look like an idiot. Things are a little easier than they would be on a uh, initial playthrough. What is it? Oh. No using the hooks. That guy died so hard. His 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 leg fell out of the exosuit. Which uh, I've got a question. We've got a question in the chat. I'm gonna kind of reshape it a little bit. Um, is there a quest uh, character that you found wasn't quite working and you had to kind of um, alter them and kind of re, re retool them a bit? We had to do like a big change on? Yeah. Yes. Vic. Vic was challenging. Um, we didn't feel like we had trouble writing her. <laughs> we didn't feel like we were having trouble. Uh, but in initial focus tests, people hated her. Like people just like... People didn't think, oh, you know, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's a tough as nails young reporter who is a little naive and stuff. They thought she was a real villainous jerk, um, and it was not going the way that we wanted it to go. People really disliked her. Um, they, they they thought that she was, um, you know, they didn't dislike her like you dislike a villain or like you know, she's not supposed to be a villain. They didn't. They disliked her like I don't like hearing her voice. <laughs> um, I don't like hearing. Uh, her attitude or her, or her personality. Um, we had to rewrite all of Case Zero twice, I think, to make it work. Um, and it, the focus test went from went from I hate her to death, like kill her, make her die, remove her from the storyline, to um, hey, I really like her now. She's a lot of fun. The storyline, like. She was really holding back the storyline to a certain degree. The story was not not receiving good reviews from the focus test early on. Um, but as we fixed Vic, oh, <laughs> I missed it. Damn it! <laughs> as we as we improved Vic, the the result the response to the story overall increased massively, um, which makes sense because you know she's kind of like the Frank's um, problem, yeah. right? Like you know she's a lot of what he. And so that's what we wanted. Is we wanted we wanted Frank to see kind of like yeah. Um, that's what we wanted Frank to see in her. And then over time, through talking through, she, you know, that that she's actually a actually a very good person. Um, yes, naive for sure, now but 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 a, definitely a good person that Frank shouldn't hate, but that Frank should still be supporting as a as a as an equal. Yeah, I've it took a lot of work to get her into a place where people really were happy with that relationship, but because they disliked her so much, we'd overdone it with making her um, uh, antagonistic to Frank's uh, problems in the story, antagonistic to who Frank wanted to be and how he thought about things. Um, well, that brings us uh, to about an hour. Uh, we finished case two. We went really quick. There's a lot of side content uh, we could have done. We could have done a lot of the uh, the events. We could have kind of explored a bit more. 
Uh, but we wanted to get uh, get to Hammond and then get through the fight um, as quickly as possible. So it was, you know, uh, let's call it an incompetent speed run. Um, yeah. I think uh, what uh, is what I'd call it. So let us pop uh, pop over to a camera only. And uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and asking some great questions. Um, I would like to thank Jeffrey Campbell, the lead writer on Dead Rising 4, for joining me today. Uh, you know, I've been playing the game and doing streams on my own, but it's great to get uh, some of the dev team in here. And uh, leading up uh, probably a bit after Christmas because people are starting to take a break. Uh, we've shipped the game and uh, there's still work going on on Dead Rising 4, but uh, a lot of people are taking an opportunity to take some time off before the holidays. So we'll be bringing people in uh, kind of in the January and after area and to talk about their aspects of the game, whether it's art, whether it's Jeff coming back for more writing talk. Uh, another commentary, if you guys like that, let us know. And, uh, yeah. Getting, we'll, we'll have to get Shannon back in. Uh, she's, she's our other writer. We actually had another writer, Peter Boychuk, as well, but he we, he left early on, or kind of like midway through, uh, as he was just, uh, you know, par involved part-time. Um, but they're definitely both part of uh, the voice and the tone that we got out of this. Um, and Shannon's just so funny, you know? Yeah. We need to have her on basically every podcast. Or yeah. every uh, stream. Every stream. I mean, she's uh, we're we're spending a lot of time playing Mass Effect uh, Two uh, with Shannon on Fridays, uh, every so often. But uh, thank you everyone for for tuning in today. Um, let us know if this is the sort of stuff you want to see more of uh, from the team here at Capcom Vancouver, and uh, we can definitely do our best to bring uh, bring you kind of inside insight and in these kind of directors' commentaries, writers' commentary type stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to leave you with a trailer, and then uh, you're on your own. You're free to go. Go uh, play the game. Thank you. Thank you. Get the notes. Take the pictures. Get out. Oh, what's this? No. Can't see a damn thing in there. Um, this looks very not good. Hold that phone. Looking good. This outbreak is almost certainly some kind of test. It's probably run by these military jerk-offs. Zombies are the worst.